Tu peraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vranta Swamaniti Namani Namaste Saravati Rivam Gaur Vani Pichani Nivashisa Sanivari Vishati Resitharani Hey Krishna Kuruna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jugapati Gopesha Gopika Akanta Ralha Akanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhi Bin Namaneshwari Vishavana Sutadevi Pramami Hari Priye Shri Radhika Prana Samam Kinyasim Vishaka Kishikchita Saukya Sostavam Lilamitinuch Chathang Madhurim Ananga Purvam Pramami Manjarim Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasa Digova Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare So I'm usually, if I if I ever get the chance to speak, I'm usually accustomed to speaking for longer than than uh, what I'm supposed to. So I'm hoping that uh, I can consolidate this time as much as possible. I thought that since today is a most um, or practically the most uh, worshipable day for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. And since our Gaudiya Vaishnava acharyas have left us with volumes of literature which help us to appreciate, at least to some extent, the um, the beauty of the pastimes of Sri Sri Radha Shamsundar. I should um, let's say in order to help us to appreciate the uh, importance of Radhastami there is some necessity to appreciate the personality of Srimati Radharani and I think that the best way to appreciate that uh, the beauty of Srimati Radharani's personality uh, first of all uh, we can hear something from the mouth of Srimati Radharani about herself about her love for Krishna and about the love of the Brajagopis for Krishna and then I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit uh, and um, uh, even at the risk of incurring the wrath of my superiors I'm going to read some selected portions of Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami's Govinda Lilamrita uh, although it is uh, a very highly esoteric and uh, secret subject matter uh, but still I've selected some portions which will help us to more appreciate uh, at least to some extent the beauty of Shimati Radharani's dealings with her beloved Shamsundar in the uh, forest of Braja Radharani is speaking here uh, to Krishna who was disguised who had disguised himself as a demigoddess this is uh, recorded in uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's uh, Prema Samputa Dear friend if you desire to know about pure love then just listen. So, although I'm acting as the mouthpiece, we should take it that these are the words of Srimati Radharani. So please listen very carefully so that you can absorb the, the, the mood. I can speak on this topic of pure love because I know about love. Even those who are thoroughly learned 
in all the Vedas cannot understand anything about the way pure divine love manifests, what love is or what love is not. If one tries to describe the topics of pure love to someone desirous of knowing about it, then whatever is described as well as whatever is understood is all merely surface information that cannot possibly convey the truth of such an indescribable phenomenon as love. Purest love is such that upon being investigated it immediately disappears and even upon not being analyzed it also disappears. When one's mind is endowed with affection that is purified of all other motives being devoid of all forms of discrimination and non-discrimination alike it then ascends the lion throne of its own natural position and shines brightly there. From this platform one performs actions only to give pleasure to one's beloved and whatever happiness one feels by performing such actions is indicative of the presence of pure love. Just as the lion conquers his prey and nourishes himself thereby, similarly this extremely powerful love nourishes itself by instantly consuming the limitless difficulties of all worldly things. That includes all problems caused by living in the present world or the next, plus all disturbances caused by family members, enemies, one's own body, all things related to the body, and also all the difficulties caused by one's beloved. Even if these problems seem as insurmountable as Mount Meru. The silky-haired lion is very proud, totally fearless, and full of confidence. When he goes to sleep, does he feel apprehensive if a dog comes nearby? Just as the lion could easily conquer the dog for his own self-interest, similarly, all the above-mentioned difficulties are effortlessly dispelled by pure love. It is also likened to the way darkness is dispelled by the bright illumination of a lamp. Due to its quality of wantonness and debauchery, this type of divine love makes my dear most beloved Krishna fresh and new from moment to moment. Tasting and relishing it creates a state of extreme intoxication. It pleases all living beings throughout the three worlds with radiant beams of nectar just like the moon during our union. Uh, but it also burns just like the sun at the time of universal devastation during our separation. In other words, all beings become pleased uh, like uh, the uh, inundation of nectar when Radha and Krishna are united and they become devastated uh, uh, at the time of Radha and Krishna's separation. O Saki, without Gopendra Nandana, where is such love? It is, found, uh, is it found anywhere else in the three worlds? Or anywhere above the three worlds? Or perhaps in the lower planetary systems? This standard of pure love is found nowhere but here in these pasture lands of Braja. And it is relished by only a few, few dear-eyed gopis in different ways according to the intensity of their feelings. When this pure love is exhibited 
Externally, this is a very important shloka. When this pure love is exhibited externally as if it were lust, then my dear most beloved experiences limitless happiness. But when someone tries to make their lust look like love, then Krishna, the abode of all clever arts, certainly knows the truth right away and he doesn't derive the slightest pleasure from it. And also, when a gopi says to her companion, Saki, I am pained by feeling so much separation. Please bring me quickly before Sri Krishna, the Lord of my life. Then she is not said to be a lusty girl. This is because her heart is concerned only with the happiness of her beloved. Whatever lust that arises, we can say transcendental lust, that arises in her own mind for the pleasure of her beloved is not called lust, but is known as pure love. Sri Krishna is the ocean of purest love and the mind of jewel-like qualities. When he becomes totally enchanted with amorous delight and dominates the gopis with his naughtiness, fickleness, and deception, he is thereby displaying his pure love for them as if it were lust. It's necessary to understand this tattva in order to it even begin to relish the essential nature of Krishna's leelas with Srimati Radharani in the, in the realm of Braja. Are hundreds and thousands of beautiful young gopis all maddened by youth and attentive in their endeavors able to satisfy the transcendental lust of Sri Krishna? Certainly not. But... I have personally experienced a special understanding of Krishna's non-duplicious love for the gopis, as well as his quality of coming under the control of their pure love. Now listen to this one. This is a great one. Because this shows another aspect of, uh, of, of, of uh, Srimati Radharani's, uh, let's say, understanding of herself her feelings of herself and it shows about herself her feelings about herself and it shows how she's willing to admit her standard of love before others uh, in, in uh, Kaviraj Goswami's Chaitanya Charitamrita it is mentioned how it is that the uh, the quality of one who has prema is that he thinks that he doesn't have prema and that if someone is thinking that he has prema, then perhaps it may be said that he really doesn't have prema in the least. However, here is a very interesting and important, uh, let's say, observation by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, who also gives expression to the same uh, principle uh, in respect, uh, with respect to his own loving sentiments toward Radha and Krishna in various verses in the pages of his books. Among all the cowherd girls of Braja, remember this is Radharani speaking about herself, Sri Krishna is particularly affectionate towards me. This is celebrated by all the people of Braja. I am not making this up. The reason his super excellent love for me is celebrated it is because my love for him is considered to be like Mount Meru, whereas the love of the other cowherd girls for him is not even like three or four mustard seeds in comparison. Just see how she's practically, transcendentally, um, let's say, in a, in a slightly indirect way, boasting her own uh, uh, standard of pure love for Krishna. My dear friend, proportionate to the degree other gopis love him, Sri Krishna loves him 
in return, loves them in return, and sports with them accordingly. There is no offense in this behavior, but if by a twist of fate something prevents the performance of his amorous sporting, which robs him of his happiness, then I become very sad. This shows how Radharani is so much attentive and absorbed in the consideration of Krishna's pleasures and distresses. And at other times, when I go to a secret place to meet with him, he may not arrive due to some obstacle. His heart is resolutely dedicated to me alone, but he falls victim to the entreaties of another girl and makes love with her. In this situation, however, he does not feel any happiness at all. Instead, he remains disturbed with anxiety, being burned by the miserable sufferings that I feel all night long. Note that her miserable sufferings are on account of understanding, although he's feeling anxiety on account of her feeling miserable sufferings all night long, her miserable sufferings are on account of her knowledge of his uh, inability to experience the highest um, summit of Mahabhav in his relationship with her. That misery he feels over my suffering while he is sporting with the other girl results in still more suffering in my mind since I respond to his every emotion. At that time, I say to myself, I have arranged this nice dress, ornaments, and sporting paraphernalia just for his pleasure, and now they are all useless if he doesn't see them. Thus I break down and cry sorrowfully. Certainly you were watching and saw all this. She's speaking to the disguised Krishna. When he finally arrives before me in the morning in a very humble mood, pleading for forgiveness, then I chastise him in great anger, saying, just leave from here. Go and enjoy with that girl again. This chastisement is also for his pleasure, for it is done only out of pure loving affection for him. In this way, you can know something about the quality of love that is exhibited here in Brajabhumi. So, just to support my, uh, let's say, you can say, audacity to read something from Sri Govinda Lilamrit in an assembly like this, because sometimes we have to remember how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur requested to be allowed to read uh, or to translate and publish Govinda Lilamrit for distribution, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur refused by telling him that uh, that you tran you translate and publish only one copy for yourself. So <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, somehow or other, by the mercy of the divine arrangement of the Supreme, our beloved God brother Kushikrata, although it was not published, and although I run the risk risk of incurring his wrath, <laughs> I will uh, nevertheless because i 've gone through every English translation available, and I have to say that actually only kushikrata 's translation is imbued with rasa. All the others are dry and quite, uh, let's say, stiff in their presentation.
But Kushikrata's translation is beautiful, full of bhav, and very flowing and sweet. Although I may not be able to do justice to it because of my inability to read very nicely. But so anyway, to substantiate or to, let's say, justify my audacity in reading this, I'm going to now quote from Gyanchandra's Padati a verse uh, which may help you to understand. Iti te saravam akyatam naitikam charitam hare papinopi vimutchante smaranad yasya narada. So, this is Vrind Devi. No, excuse me. It's Sadashiva telling to Narada Muni, who has just heard the Astakalya Lila from Brinda Devi and has come back to his guru, Sadashiva. Uh, so, uh, Sadashiva tells, O oh Narada, no, this, excuse me. No, this is this is Vrinda Devi herself telling to Narada. O oh Narada, I have described to you all of Sri Krishna's daily pastimes. By remembering these leelas, even sinners will be liberated. By remembering these leelas, even sinners will be liberated. So I think that we should not I should not think that uh, that our assembly of Vaishnavas here come in the category of sinners. So if even sinners will be liberated by hearing the Astakalya Lilas or remembering the Astakalya Lilas of Brajendananda Krishna and Radharani, then it may also do us well to time to time take the opportunity to peek into that realm of ambrosial bliss so <coughs> Krishna has finished the morning pastimes his morning his breakfast pastimes with the cowherd boys and he has uh, um, let's say set out for the forest along with the cowherd boys and the cows and all the brajbasis are uh, let's say following behind and Krishna manages to convince them to return and goes with his cowherd boyfriends into the pasture grounds but because he's always thinking of a certain young girl and that's the image of that certain young girl is tormenting his heart again and again in his feelings of separation, uh, he begins to see everything in the Vrnavan forest as resembling her bodily features. And then, Madhu Mangala, uh, let's say, comes understanding Krishna's condition. He comes and by some joking induces Krishna to take his mind off of the, of the uh, certain young girl who's tormenting him for a little while by playing with the cowherd boys. So, uh, Krishna plays with the cowherd boys for some time and then, again, naturally, his mind drifts back to the, uh, to the thoughts of his uh, beloved certain young girl. Who is that certain young girl? Can anyone say who that certain young girl? Jai Jai Shri. So his mind drifts back to his thoughts of Shimati Radharani and uh, on some pretext he, uh, he leaves the company of the cowherd boys and goes to Radha Kund <clears throat> where he is, he has, uh, uh, let's say, arranged previously um, 
uh, uh, by um, uh, his uh, his glances at his priya gun upon leaving Braja, he he is glancing in a certain direction to indicate to them in which in which place uh, they may hope to find him. So he goes to the shores of Radhakund. So Krishna is waiting in the shores of Radhakund. Meanwhile, Radharani has somehow or other left her mother-in-law's house with her sucky gun and is going along the forest path very, very slowly and she's seeing everything in the forest because of her intense uh, Prema, Mahabhav for Krishna she's seeing everything in the forest as resembling different aspects of Krishna's personality and personal paraphernalia then she sees the dancing of peacock with peahens other than his own wife uh, uh, and he sees Saranga, Krishna's pet deer associating with other uh, than his own Sangini and she becomes disturbed thinking that Krishna has fallen victim to the entreaties of Shaibya Gopi and Padma Gopi and has gone to uh, sport with Chandravali so she's becoming she became very much upset but somehow or other, Brinda Devi pacifies her and they proceed onward more quickly, being newly enthused by the hopes of actually getting the chance to again have the association of Sham Sundar. So anyway, waiting in that grove, Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna directly saw his beloved Radharani as she passed along the Bakul lined road with her friends. Seeing her, this gives you some idea. Why I'm reading this is because I want to give you some idea of the intensity of Krishna's attraction to Srimati Radharani and Radharani's attraction to her beloved Krishna. Seeing her, he became overwhelmed with amorous desires stunned he could not move from that spot when Srimati Radharani saw her lover Krishna standing on the road she became astonished and overwhelmed with intense love the gopis thought Krishna to be a tamal tree and they all laughed at Radharani causing her great embarrassment as they glanced at each other the divine couple became intoxicated with transcendental bliss and their hearts became conquered by seeing each other's limitless transcendental qualities. In the following words, they guessed about the identity of what they had just seen. Krishna is thinking, Is this the deity of bodily luster? Is this the goddess of youthfulness? Is this personified transcendental opulence? Is this personified sweetness? Is this personified slender gracefulness? Is this the ocean of beauty? Is this the flowing river of transcendental bliss? Is this the great monsoon rains of nectar? Perhaps this is actually a beautiful girl who delights my senses in this way Lord Krishna continued the beautiful face of this person is like a moon that delights the chakura birds of my eyes this person is like a host of lotus flowers that delight the bumblebees of my nose this person is uh, like a flood of mango juice inundating the cuckoo of my tongue. This person is like an assemblage of pleasantly jingling ornaments 
that delights my ears. This person is like a river of nectar that extinguishes the blazing forest fire of my lust. Remember, it's transcendental lust, okay? This person is like a blossoming cup of riksha tree that fulfills all my desires. I think this person must be my beloved Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani then said, Is this a dark tamal tree? Is this a fresh rain cloud? Is this a sapphire mountain peak? Is this a mountain range of black cosmetic? Is this a swarm of intoxicated bumblebees? Is this the dark current of the Yamuna River? Is this a cluster of blue lotus flowers? Is this the sidelong glance of the deer-eyed gopis? Is this the handsome demigod Cupid? Is this the pious monarch of all sweetness? Is this the expanded ocean of nectar? Is this a blossoming Amara tree? I think this is my lover, Lord Krishna. How is it that I have become so fortunate as to meet him in this place? Srimati Radharani said, O friend Vishaka, I am bewildered. I do not know whether this is my lover Krishna or a blue lotus flower standing before the two bumblebees of my eyes. Please tell me the truth. What is this beautiful object standing before me? After speaking these words, Srimati Radharani's bodily hairs stood up in ecstasy because she'd been so many times tricked in, in, the, in the past into thinking that a tamal tree was Krishna and embracing the tamal tree uh, and becoming totally embarrassed before her gopi friends when she realized that it wasn't Krishna. And in Krishna Bhavanamrita, conversely, it is seen that she's thinking that Krishna is a tamal tree and she's thinking that, well, anyway, let me embrace this tamal tree uh, because after all, you know, we don't have the association of Krishna, so I have to satisfy my, remember, transcendental lust somehow or other. So, and then, uh, as, as she begins to embrace the tamal tree, she uh, suddenly realizes when Krishna, the tamal tree starts to embrace her uh, in return, reciprocating her embrace, she, starts to, she, begin, she suddenly realizes that it's actually Krishna and, and uh, becomes again totally embarrassed before all of her friends, girlfriends. So Radharani is asking uh, to uh, Vishaka that tell me in truth, who, what is this? Who is this? After speaking these words, Radharani's hair stood up in ecstasy. Her voice became choked up and her eyes moved restlessly about as the gopis smiled and laughed. Vishaka answered her question in the following words. Standing before you is the dark tilak marking that will be drawn in musk on your forehead. Standing before you is the musk dot that will be placed on your chin. Standing before you is the black mascara that will adorn your eyes. Stand. Standing before you is the pair of blue ornaments 
that will adorn your ears. Standing before you is the garland of blue lotus flowers that will rest upon your neck. My dear friend with a beautiful face, standing before you is your lover Krishna. Standing before you is your supreme good fortune. By seeing each other, the divine couple became overwhelmed with ecstatic love and their hearts, minds, and bodies became agitated with intense bliss. For a moment, they stood stunned, unable to move or act. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Rama. There's more. There's a lot more. Please excuse me. Please forgive me. Sri Krishna made the two expert dancers of his eyes dance on the glistening stage of the sweet beauty of the female dancer of Srimati Radharani's transcendental body. It's described here, I'm skipping a few verses just because time is running. and uh, It's described here how Brinda Devi is causing the two, two male dancers of Radha and Krishna's minds to dance along with the two female dancers of Radha and Krishna's body, bodies before the assembly of Sakis making the assembly of Sakis very happy Sri Krishna made the two expert dancers of his eyes dance on the glistening stage of the sweet beauty of the female dancer of Srimati Radharani's transcendental body. This dancing greatly pleased Srimati Radharani, who showered many delightful lotus flowers on the dancers of Krishna's <laughs> eyes uh, from the corner of her eyes. Corners of her eyes. When the gopis in the audience saw all this, they became filled with transcendental happiness. When Srimati Radharani saw Lord Krishna just before her, her progress stopped and she assumed an attitude of opposition. This is very important in order to understand the personality of Srimati Radharani. Radharani is a Bama Gopi. She is left wing. Left wing means that she is contrary by nature. She is Vama Madhya, which means that she can be Prakara at some times, or harsh, like Lalita Devi, and she can be Mridvi, also sometimes, like Vishaka Devi. Vishaka Devi is, although she is exalted in her mood, but she is much softer. She's like a right, she's a right wing Saki, and Lalita is a left wing Saki. So sometimes they um, they they uh, they serve in accordance with which mood Shrimati Radharani desires to manifest for the pleasure of Krishna. Although her face was slightly covered, uh, uh, although her face was slightly covered by a blue garment, her two starry eyes were agitated, being wide and curved. Thus, she was decorated with the ornaments of Vilas, and her beauty increased to give pleasure to Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, it's des uh, there's described, the, in this description, there will be uh, indication of varieties of different types of bhavas that are manifest in the dealings of Srimati Radharani with Krishna and we don't have time to discuss but you will hear just like the, the ornaments of Vilas and various other ornaments Kilakin Chitta and other ornaments will be described and we won't get into uh, let's say defining them etc we'll just read on and you'll have to just get whatever you can get out of it let's see 
she, thus she was decorated with the ornaments of Vilas and her beauty increased to give pleasure to Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Radharani was drawn to Krishna. She longed to be with him. But she felt shy because her gopi friends because her gopi friends were by her side. Although she was extremely delighted and agitated with intense ecstatic love for Krishna, she carefully concealed her actual feelings, pretending to casually pick some flowers on the path leading back to her home. Srimati Radharani was attracted to Krishna, but because she was surrounded by elder, stronger gopi friends who understood the nature of her desire, she felt timid. She neither left the place nor approached closer to Krishna. When Srimati Radharani was decorated with the ornament of Lalit, the Alit, Lalit Alankar, just to increase Krishna's love, an attractive curve was manifested manifest by her neck, knees and waist. This was brought about by her timidity and apparent desire to avoid Krishna. Krishna Radharani's nature of love is characterized by her inwardly saying yes, yes, yes and her outwardly saying no, no, no to Krishna. So, you will see this practically in, in the, uh, the uh, let's say, small uh, um, section, uh, sample of uh, the pastimes that will now commence. The male dancer, wait a minute, where are we? The flickering movement of her eyebrows could conquer the powerful bow of Cupid to increase the joy of her beloved's love. The male dancer of Lord Hari's mind became very pleased to see the beautiful transcendental qualities of the female dancer of Shimati Radharani's body. When he approached to embrace her, the female dancer of Lord Hari's transcendental body followed close behind. The mind was the male dancer going to, approaching to embrace and the female dancer of Krishna's body uh, 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 followed close behind. Sri Krishna said to Srimati Radharani, My beloved, in your haste to meet me at this rendezvous, you have placed your garments and ornaments in all the wrong places. This shows how restless and agitated your mind is with a desire to meet me. Come here, I shall fix your ornaments and garments putting them in the right places. Although Srimati Radharani yearned to be touched by her lover, Sri Krishna, she restlessly, restlessly moved her eyes and silently shrank from his joking advances. In this way, she delighted Lord Krishna by decorating her beautiful form with the ornament known as Vibharam Alankar. Displaying shyness, fear, crookedness, and clever deceptiveness, Srimati Radharani picked some flowers and then began, then began to move away. Amorous Lord Hari stood in front of her to check her departure. Although Radharani was in, inwardly delighted by this, she, pen, pre, she pretended to be very angry. Agitated by tears, Srimati Radharani's eyes were tinged with red, just like the eastern horizon at sunrise. Her lips began to move with jubilation and amorous desire. Her eyebrows curved and her lotus face, lotus-like face, smiled mildly. Just when we're reading this, although it, I'm not going to read the most intimate part, so don't worry. That's for you in your, the privacy of your bhajan. But I just want that we should understand that our Radha Sham Sundar, which Srila Prabhupada has mercifully brought to us by installing the deity of Radha Sham Sundar in the temple, 
this, these, these deities are not just deities. These deities are personalities. And so, as we hear this description, we should try to appreciate that this is the description of the activities of these two personalities, our very Shishi Radha Sham Sundar. And try to, try to enter into an understanding of the beauty of Radha and Sham Sundar's loving relationships with them, between themselves and with all of their devotees. You're invited to have a loving relationship with Srimati Radharani and her beloved Sham Sundar. And the easiest way is to, is to uh, say, become at least gradually educated about the beauty of their personalities. Seeing Radharani's face exib- exhibit such emotions, Lord Sri Krishna felt a million times happier than when embracing uh, when, when then when embraced by her indeed lord shri krishna's happiness is not at all mundane some people think that the, the union of radha and krishna is the summit but actually the the uh, the experiences that radha and krishna have in the course of their uh, various other types of sambhog uh, um, leelas uh, because those other types of sambhog leelas are, you can say, fraught with, um, with vipralamba, which keeps them at a distance, but, and, and thereby intensifies their, uh, the happiness that they experience in their anticipation of meeting. Alarmed, Shimati Radharani raised her creeper-like arm as if to pick a flower from a blossoming branch of a nearby punaga tree. What is it, 10, thir- 10 o'clock already? So what should I do? Dina Bandhu? It's hard, you know, should I just keep going? or Because uh, the Abhishek is supposed to start at 10.15. I didn't know what time it was. You want to speak? Okay. So... All right, I didn't get to the part that I really wanted to get to, unfortunately. But okay. So, yeah, Hare Krishna. So maybe some other time we'll 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 uh, do it again. What happened anyway? Just let me finish the sentence or something, you know. So. <laughs> Damn clock. We're missing the best part. I should have gone to the best part. Huh? Anyway. Hare Krishna. <laughs> This is really good, though. The best part is really good. Should, should, should I do it? <laughs> you gave the Hindi class anyway. You got to speak something. <laughs> okay, anyway. Where are we? So anyway, Radharani uh, reaps, uh, reaches her creeper-like arm to pick a flower uh, from the from the uh, punaga tree, uh, at, 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 you know, pretending to ignore Krishna. And then, uh, and Krishna sees the, the the beauty of her form, just like when the gopis will carry the pots on the on the pretext of holding the pot steady, they uh, they reveal the beauty of their transcendental form. Uh, before their uh, prananath Krishna. So, uh, amorous Lord Krishna stood in front of her to check her departure. She pretends to be angry, then she and then she extends her har- arm to uh, pick a, a flower, and uh, the tree uh, immediately burst into full bloom. At the same time, 
Krishna sees the beauty of her form in that way. Although Lord Krishna had carefully studied the many texts of the philosophy of love from his saintly te young teacher, he still wished to defeat her in debate. This is certainly very astonishing. Krishna says, Who is this picking my flower? Radha. It is not just anyone. It is I. Who are you? Krishna says. You, don't, uh, you do not know who I am? Krishna says, and Radharani says, No, I do not know you. Radharani says, uh, Krishna says, There's no Radha, Krishna, Radha, Krishna, so I'm, I'm having to decipher it for you. Um, huh? Okay, just follow. So you, you'll have to understand it. Let's, let's start it again. Who is this picking my flower? Radha says, It is not just anyone, it is I. Who are you? You do not know who, uh, who I am? No, I do not know you. If you don't recognize me, I think you should leave this place at once. Radharani says, Krishna says, I am a male, male bumblebee drinking the honey of these flowers. If I leave this place, I shall not be able to live. If I leave this place, where shall I go? Radha says, Go to your bumblebee mate. Krishna says, You are the bumblebee mate I have found among these flowers. After speaking these words, Lord Madhusudana approached nearer to Srimati Radharani. Then he spoke the following words. My dear girl, you are very charming and you are also enchantingly beautiful. In addition to this, you are also very saintly and born in a highly respectable noble family. In spite of these exalted qualifications, you are not so timid that you will not approach this Punaga tree. Punaga tree is also translated as Krishna. So that's to be understood. If you are not re uh, reluctant to approach this tree in the forest, then why should you be ashamed to freely wander from forest to forest? Your sudden shyness is certainly very surprising. You and I and all our friends have come to this forest to worship the sun god. We are all very enthusiastic to worship him. My dear girl, just look at this punaga tree. Although the flowering malati creepers enthusiastically embrace him, he still does not embrace them in return. My dear girl, with a beautiful face, you look bewildered. I think you do not understand anything of the, of the words I have spoken. Listen carefully and I shall explain them to you. I said that this punaga tree is cooled by various friendly and unfriendly winds. I said that although many Malati creepers embrace this Punaga tree, he never gets the chance to embrace them in return. Emperor Cupid, the ruler of this forest, has happily appointed me as his policeman. I have personally seen you steal a flower here, and so I shall punish you by confiscating the two jewel pictures sprouted from your youthful beauty. Emperor Cupid, oh, if you uh, had asked permission, saying, I request that I may be allowed to pick a flower, then I would not even notice you picking flowers. I am always accompanied by my cowherd friends, and I never have the opportunity to see any beautiful young girls. How can I refuse a beautiful young girl like you? Indeed, what young boy can retain a peaceful demeanor when he sees a beautiful young girl like you in a secluded place like this? Furthermore, you are not alone. You are always surrounded by thousands of gopi accomplices. You have stolen the supreme treasure in this pious kingdom. And if, you do not, and if I do not punish you, then I myself will be severely punished by King Cupid. If you can follow what he's intending to say. And if you can't, then that's good. <laughs> you don't deserve to. <laughs> so. At that time, Srimati Radharani replied in the following words. We regularly pick flowers from this forest 
But we, but but uh, but yet we have never seen, um, never before seen you posted here as a policeman. As as for this Emperor Cupid, we have never heard of him, even in dream. So why do you usually, oh, excuse me, why do you uselessly chatter these lies? Give up these tall tales about Cupid and tell us the truth. Lord Krishna replied. In the following, uh, uh, Lord Krishna replied in the following words: Intently devoted to herding the Sarabi cows, and blindly confident that everything was already protected by my great prowess, I neglected my guard duties. Because of my de- neglect, you were able to steal some of this forest wealth without being detected. King Cupid has already punished me for tolerating your crimes. But now, hiding myself, I have captured you. For your own good, I shall now hand you over to him, and that King Cupid, of whom you have never heard, you will see with your own eyes. Radharani said, "Be kind. Excuse my crime. Do not punish me. I did not know there was a policeman guarding these forests." Lord Krishna said, "How is your release possible?" I have no power to release you from the hand of justice. The moving and stationary creatures of the forest became very agitated to see your crimes, and they reported all of them to King Cupid. King Cupid angrily punished me with a stick for my incompetence and ordered me to bring before him this girl who has never heard of him. This forest, which has an area of 32 miles, is Cupid's kingdom. This is Braja, Brindavan Forest, is Cupid's kingdom. Uh, you have all come to Cupid's kingdom, so you should learn something about Cupid's kingdom after all. And the grass and other valuable objects in the forest are King Cupid's treasury. Who are his subjects? Listen attentively, and I shall describe them. King Cupid's subjects are the saintly Braja Gopis who are enriched with the beauty and opulences of all the universe. Lord Krishna continued. Here it is. Listen carefully, my dear girl. I think that the limbs of your body, embarrassed by great poverty, have become professional thieves, and they wander through this forest of Vrindavan, stealing the wealth that Cupid has placed there. I think the palm of your hand must have stolen its beauty from the lotus petals in Vrindavan. I think your body has stolen, has certainly stolen the graceful motions of the swans and intoxicated elephants. I think your fingernails and toenails have stolen their beauty from the mirror-like reflections in the still ponds of Vrindavan. I think your legs have stolen their beauty from the golden plantain trees. I think your knees have stolen their beauty from the uh, exquisitely fashioned jeweled cases. I think your thighs have stolen their beauty from the graceful trunks of the elephants. I think your torso has stolen the beauty of the splendid courtyards by the Yamuna shore. I think your waist has stolen its beauty from the slender waist of the lion. I think your navel has stolen its beauty from the ponds of nectar. I think. The lines of hair stretching from your navel to your breast has stolen its beauty from the glistening black snake. I think your abdomen has stolen its beauty from the banyan leaves. I think your breasts have stolen their beauty from tall fruits, tree fruits, unblossomed lotus buds, Cupid's personal throne, and the frontal lobes of regal elephants. I think your arms have stolen their beauty from lotus stalks. And Cupid's rope. I think your fingers have stolen their beauty from the petals of the Ashok flowers. I think your I think you have stolen your beauty from the multitude of Cupid's own personal potencies. I think your body uh, bodily luster has stolen its beauty from the flashes of lightning. I think the hair on your head has stolen its beauty from the swarms of black bumblebees. I think your teeth. Have stolen their beauty from the pearls and diamonds. I think your skin has stolen its beauty from gold. 
I think your eloquent words have stolen their charm from the parrot's speeches. I think your singing has stolen its beauty from the cuckoo's songs. I think your dancing has stolen its gracefulness from the peacocks. I think your eyes have stolen their beauty from the white jasmine flowers, safari fishes, chakura birds, kanjana birds, and the eyes of doves. I think your eyebrows have stolen their beauty from Cupid's bow. I think the movements of your eyes have stolen their beauty from the Cupid's bowstring. <coughs> I think your glances have stolen their beauty from Cupid's sharpened arrows. I think your lips have stolen their beauty from roses and bandujiva flowers. I think your teeth have stolen their beauty from pomegranate seeds. I think your neck has stolen its beauty from the lines in the conch shell. I think your hair has stolen its beauty from the chamara's tail. I think your graceful gestures have stolen their beauty from the gentle waves in the Amuna River. In this way, everything you have has been stolen. It is actually the proper uh, the property of Emperor Cupid. <laughs> so so this is this is Krishna describing Radharani's form. So I thought that that would be appropriate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's good we read it. <laughs> Listen further, if you don't mind. What time is it? <laughs> Lord Krishna's joking words were like nectar flowing into Radharani's ears. Hearing these words caused her body to spontaneously manifest various symptoms of ecstatic love, which she was able to suppress and conceal only with great effort. She whispered under her breath, What lies this libertine? Krishna has placed upon my ears. I must have. I, I, I must leave this place immediately. From the corner of her charming eyes, Radharani contemptuously stared at her lover Krishna. Feigning indifference, she began to quickly exit. Lord Krishna grasped the corner of her sari and said, "Wicked girl! First you insult me, and then you try to escape. Where do you think you're going?" Lord Krishna's touch overwhelmed Radharani with feelings of ecstatic bliss. Her head tilted, Radharani gazed at her beloved Krishna. Srimati Radharani's smiling glance. Now we get to hear uh, uh, something of Radharani's uh, uh, type of, uh, you can say, response to such lies coming from Krishna. Lies in quotes coming from Krishna. We actually know the truth. Srimati Radharani's smiling glance ran from the corner of her contempt-filled eyes to Lord Krishna's lotus face and then back again. She, just as a swarm of bees flies back and forth from a lotus flower, reddened with tears of happiness by Lord Krishna's touching her sari's edge, Radharani's glance drowned her beloved Krishna in a shoreless ocean of transcendental bliss. As Srimati Radharani pulled Lord Krishna's hand from her sari's edge, she pierced him with Cupid's arrows shot from the corners of her crooked eyes. Blinded and maddened with ecstatic love, she spoke the following words to her beloved Krishna, whose beautiful lotus eyes were decorated with a gentle smile, as sweet as nectar. My dear Krishna, I think you are the most handsome and sweet thing in all the material or spiritual worlds. You are perfectly correct to laugh at my beauty and, criti and criticize it for being a thief. My dear Krishna, of course she's speaking in a cunning way. My dear Krishna, you certainly know everything about the beauty of the young gopis, for when, with a saintly simplicity, after the Katyani Vrat, you... you uh, uh, they placed their folded hands on their heads to offer prayers to Varuna. You saw the beauty of their naked bodies. This is during the pastime of Krishna stealing the garments of the gopis. My dear Krishna, as the worshipable, virtuous, supremely qualified young prince of Braja, you could have married any one of countless beautiful girls. That you remain unmarried is proof of how vigorously you control your senses and how firmly you are fixed in the vow of celibacy. My dear Krishna, 
you nevertheless possess a certain attribute such that there is no girl who after hearing of it will agree to accept you as her husband. In other words, they, they prefer to enjoy the parakya ras as an unspoken statement. My dear Krishna, because no girl will marry you, you are forced to remain celibate. This is no great credit to you. My dear Krishna, if you are such a staunch celibate brahmachari, then why are you so eager to gaze into the faces of the wives of others? Why do you enjoy amorous pastimes with the wives of others? My dear Krishna, I think that you falsely pose as a celibate brahmachari just to trick others. A brahmachari is supposed to perform Vedic sacrifices. I think the only sacrifice you perform is to break the chastity of the young girls and saintly wives of Braja. My dear Krishna, we all thought that you were in charge of herding numberless, num numberless surabi cows. Jai Jai Sri Radhe. Now it appears that you have abandoned that occupation and become policemen of the forest where trees, creepers and flowers grow without having been planted by any farmer. This is certainly very wonderful. This famous forest of Vrindavan was created by the potency of our friend Vrindadevi. She gave it to me and she personally crowned me its queen showering me with precious gems. It is not true that you and King Cupid are the rulers of this place. This is my pastime forest on the shore of my lake. This is my grove named Kama Sarma Prad where my throne is placed. No males are allowed to enter this place which bears the name Kantavarta Shudaduk the nectar news of my lover. My gopi friends always stay in this place drinking the nectar of the news of my lover. We are simply picking a single flower to serve the sun guide. Why are you so shameless and selfish that you wish to stop us? My dear celibate brahmachari, you have no business in this flower garden where young girls play. Leave this place. Return to your cowherd friends and protect the sarabi cows as they eat the fresh grasses of Braja. As Radharani spoke, the Keturah bird of Lord Hari eagerly drank the flood of nectarine joking words flowing from uh, Shimati Radharani's cooling, beautifully smiling, moon-like face. As the Chikora bird Hari drank, the Chikora birds of the Gobi's eyes uh, showed signs of dissatisfaction. Anyway, then Radharani proceeds onward and it becomes too intim intimate, probably for at least some of us in this assembly. So at that point, I would like to beg Dina Bandhu's forgiveness and, uh, and the forgiveness of any of my superiors who might uh, object to my audacity in reading such things. But because it's Radharani's appearance day and she's especially compassionate, that is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so compassionate. Because actually... Mahaprabhu wanted to distribute this Ujvala uh, Braja Ras, Madhurya Ras, especially, <coughs> to the conditioned souls. So it would do us well to become at least uh, somewhat acquainted and, uh, in the course of our progress in spiritual life. Jai Jai Sri Radhe Sham. Huh? Two words. Dina Bandu wants to speak two words. <laughs> two more words. <laughs> Kunda Dad is saying, What about the Abhishek? What about the Abhishek? Two minutes, he says.